Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to the Umbrella Hour. Our guest today is Buck Angel, who lives in the United States. Well, welcome, Buck. I'm glad to have you on the show. Awesome, brother. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. You know, I've known about you for many, many years, and then we became acquainted with each other just a few years ago, and and we've collaborated on some things in more recent years, and it's been terrific to get to know you. You know, when I first heard about you years and years ago, you were such a lightning rod in the community. <laughs> and back then I was not a lightning rod. And and now I, I've joined the ranks of lightning rods. So. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, my friend, you made it. <laughs> I'm, I'm only 18 years into transition and I'm finally there, <laughs> lightning rod level. Right. But so we have listeners from all over the world, Buck. And so what I'd like for you to do is to just tell us, tell us about you. Who is Buck Angel? Give us a little bit of your history. Tell us what kinds of things you're into as far as the work you're doing, family, anything you'd like to share with us. And then we'll go into some topics after that. Awesome. So first off, hi, everybody. Thanks for having me, Xander. I'm really excited that you have this radio show going on. It's so important at this time, especially. So my name is Buck Angel. I am a female to male transsexual. I'm a biological female who transitioned about 30 years ago to live as a man. and I actually worked in the adult entertainment business like 20 years ago. I created adult entertainment specifically for trans men. And I did that specifically to sort of expose our bodies to in a way that was mm, sexualized, I guess, but also to, mm, for lack of a better word, normalize us and see that some of us have different bodies. And it's important that we share that within ourselves. And it, it's helped me, you know, sex really helped me connect to my body a lot. And um, I don't actually have bottom surgery, so I still have a vagina. And, and that's okay for me. Some people need that. Some people don't. So with that, I moved into public speaking and started traveling the world talking about my specifically just my own transition. And then from there, I created sexual wellness products, which some people call sex toys. I did the very first, the world's first transgender sex toy, which uh, became a huge hit. And really, the guys love it. And it really helped them sort of connect to their bodies. And from there, I just really became, I I don't really like to call myself an activist, because I think that word now has been sort of hijacked on some level and not in a good way. But I, I would say an advocate. So I advocate for transitioning, but in adult space. I speak out a lot about this idea of children who are trans and transitioning, which I'm, I'm against. I also am here speaking out on women's rights. So I see things in this transgender newer community. And I also want to know, want people to understand, I, I consider myself a transsexual, not, not, I don't use the label transgender. And the reason I do that is because I feel transsexual is more of who I am, which is a medicalized space. And I have a mental disorder called gender dysphoria. That it's helped me connect to my body. And I live as a man. I don't live as a trans person. I don't identify as a trans person. I identify as a man who is a transsexual. So I just want to put that there too. So on some level, I'm at odds these days with a a newer generation of trans people. And I feel on some level that the community has been hijacked by people who don't particularly care for a person like myself because I am very outspoken about my biology and that I'll never change my sex. And there's this idea that you can't actually change your sex and biology is a social construct. And I laugh because it's just so absurd. And also, I just don't believe in giving children medications that are irreversible, contrary to what's being said out there. And I feel like, you know, I need to step up. I care about kids and I care about the future of the trans community. And I I feel like we're going in a very bad direction, that we're not being honest with the world. And I've always been very honest about who and what I am. And even pretty much traveling the world naked on some level and being very, very okay with myself. And so I just feel, as I sit here with you today, Xander, that I'm not happy with what I see. And it makes me upset because the transition really was such a positive, amazing thing for me. And I see people that it's not working out that way. And I see a group of people called detransitioners that are really alarming me as an elder in in this community. And and when I say that, I mean that they're even being hidden, that we're not talking about it. It's as if they don't exist and you know, or else you're not trans anymore. Or they, some people think these detransitioners are against us. They're not against us in any, I talked to many of them. They, they want to alert the world about what's happening and how, you know, you can go on a 20 minute intake and next thing you know, you're on testosterone. That is very dangerous. So I sit here today to sort of be an open book and talk about things that have been 
called transphobic on some level and are being told that we cannot talk about, like you cannot ask a trans person these questions when I completely disagree with the narrative that's coming out of that space. Well, thank so, you so much, Buck, for all that great information about you, you. And, and what's important to you, what you're passionate mm -hmm. about. Let me just jump on a couple of those things. So not that long ago, I started running into individuals that said that using the word transition was transphobic. Have you heard that? Never. I mean, wow, dude. I mean, just being trans is transphobic. <laughs> I think, I think the idea is that maybe it's, it's too exclusionary because it leaves out perhaps individuals who aren't going to go from one binary category to the other. So like, I also classify myself as a transsexual. So I'm a biological female, a natal female, right? My body until I had hysterectomy produced eggs, right? Sure. Large gametes. And so for, for somebody like me, somebody like you, it sounds like, you know, we went from, albeit masculine women, right? Who were part of lesbian community, both of us, into trans male community. And we both have primary partners who are women, Yes. Right. That are not That's trans. Right. And so, so I think transition makes sense for us. I yeah. think it used to make sense for a lot of other people because even if you're non-binary or gender diverse or gender non-conforming, mm -hmm. you still might go through a social transition or something like yeah. that. But so you haven't heard that. Well, that, I'm good. I'm glad it's not catching on because I, yeah. I was a little confused by it. You talked about going around the world naked and it made me think <laughs> of your statue. <laughs> <laughs> right on, my friend. Thank you. Yeah. I actually had a really great artist named Mark Quinn who came to me, gosh, maybe it's been 10 years now and asked me to do a, he asked to do a sculpture of me. So I have a nude full sculpture of me in the Adelaide Museum of Art that is pretty powerful. You know, people see it every day and they see a naked body of like our naked bodies. And it's just been extreme. It doesn't say trans on it or anything. It just says buck with cigar, which I think is so beautiful on, on some level. It's just celebrating me and saying this is who I am and I've never I'm not you know I'm not the guy that pushes myself on people if you don't accept me that's okay I have no issues and that's one of the concerns I have with this new sort of trans space today we, we're forcing people to accept us and we're not being realistic that not everybody's gonna accept us they never will and that's okay we don't need to be validated by the world we need to be validated by ourselves and so I'm wondering, are people transitioning to be validated by the world or to be a part of a group of people or are they really doing it for a personal reason, which I think you and I both did that? Well, you know, when you talk about individuals who have detransitioned, who report that they went through a very brief, you mentioned 20 minutes, but it could have, could even just be an hour, uh, a single assessment before they got access to hormones. I, I think yeah. that a lot of people don't believe that that's actually happening, uh, but I also, I do know it's happening, but it's, it's not everywhere, right? And, and even in the same clinics, you can have, 10 different people access the same clinic. It depends on who they get assigned to. Yes. And it also depends, right. it depends a lot on their own particular s story. Their, their, yes. you know, what they're bringing. And so, but there are particular clinics in the United States in particular that do not have mental health services available, period, but you can go to them and start the hormones. So a lot of people don't know that. You mentioned yeah. something about how you said with gender dysphoria, for you, you said, I have a condition. It's mm -hmm. called gender dysphoria. Where mm -hmm. I differ on that is I say, I meet the criteria for gender dysphoria. Great. But but I don't like to be labeled with a disorder, but that comes mm -hmm. from a history of being institutionalized. There you go. In a psychiatric facility for over a year and going through yeah. having been put through conversion therapy in that setting oh. and having to have these labels on me of yeah. incorrigible, which is not a very fun label to have as a young person. It would be sure. oppositionally defiant now for people who are interested oh. in, in looking at that. Right. It's yeah. for me, I have a very visceral reaction against being labeled, but I do tell people I, I meet the criteria for gender dysphoria. Great. And I Great. feel like as long as it's not something that it's not bogging me down. That's right. Right. Because I, right. I made the changes. I took hormones and I changed all right. my, my documents and, and I had surgeries and now I mm -hmm. live the life that I want to live. I don't look back. 
Whereas well, some that, people still do have distress associated. That's right. With because dysphoria. which again, we're all different. That's why these conversations are extremely important. We are not a monolithic community, though they're trying to make it as seem that way. We are not. Many of us don't want to transition to look male. Many can't because maybe they have an adverse reaction to the testosterone, or maybe they just don't want to, and that's okay too. But for me, it's very important my diagnosis because my diagnosis really helped me understand what's wrong on some level. Why am I feeling so disconnected in the world? Why do I want to be a man. Why, you know, so when I got the gender dysphoria diagnosis, it, it just sort of helped me. And, and it's why I sort of embraced it. I don't push it away. I just have said, okay, I'm this guy who has gender dysphoria. Now I can make it work by fixing my physical being. So, and also today, I just hear things that you can just self ID as trans. And I do have issues with that because I find that could be quite a slippery slope because if you just want to identify as trans, that's a little bit different than actually going through the whole medical space and you diagnosed yourself as having this space that you need to be trans. I, I, I And that's why I talk to detransitioners because almost every single one, and I've spoken to hundreds of them, they all pretty much have the same story. You know, I do know that there are clinics that don't do the 20-minute rush, but there are many of them that do. And most every single one of the detransitioners said they only had 15 to 20 minute intake, none of their mental health problems were addressed like BPD or you know, autism or any of the things that we're seeing today were never addressed. And so they could have been addressed prior to that and possibly not had to transition, but dealt with other things that were going on. Some of them have a lot of sexual trauma. Almost, I think every detransitioner I spoke to had some sexual trauma. Wow. The audience, the listening audience, if they review the description of the Umbrella Hour, they'll see that I'm a licensed clinical social worker. That's right. And what that means is in my particular field as a medical social worker, I, every single patient I ever saw, I did a comprehensive biopsychosocial assessment. It's it's foundational. It's what social That's workers right. do. <laughs> and so it doesn't matter whether the person was there for, for caregiver services or to get connected with dialysis or yeah. if they were having an organ transplant or they were coming into the homeless program or they were seeking drug and alcohol treatment or they were just yeah. given a diabetes diagnosis by the doctor and referred over for psychoeducation. Yeah. Biopsychosocial assessment, period. And so I do support providing those assessments, you know, conducting those assessments with people who want to access medications. Any yes. medication, right. any any medication, any medication yeah. that should be. But it feels like the only thing now that you don't need that is being trans. I, I think any other comorbidity or thing, it feels like you have to go through some form of system. But there's this loose system here in the United States. I don't, I don't know about other countries. But here in the United States, it's super easy to get on testosterone. You could actually go on the internet and go on a website and have a, you know, quote unquote, meeting with a clinician on a Zoom and have testosterone sent to your house. And I just feel like it's a little loose. And testosterone is not something to be playing around with. It's not something you can put on and take off. There are things that will happen to you that are irreversible. And and and, and so I don't understand this ease, this ease to access of something that can be so detrimental to your health. Well, let's, let's, let's break down the argument. So the argument as I know it from my few years involved in, in WPATH, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, is that in the, so we're on standards of care version eight right now. Yeah. So in the first, say, six versions of the standards of care, there was what has been nicknamed gatekeeping, right? <laughs> gatekeeping. So what people mean by that is that you had to pass through the eye of a needle in order to get access to hormones and surgeries and, and yep. document changes. And yep. so- it was much more difficult. It was much yeah. more challenging. I'm sure that it's also equally true that there are far fewer people who have detransitioned who went through that process. That's then right. you have people who maybe with standards of care seven, which I think came out in 2011, okay. right? So starting in 2011, that's when things started to loosen up. And what happened? Well, one, they dropped the real life experience requirement. Yep. for right. for surgeries they also they brought down the therapy from a certain number of months like quote unquote required even though it's just standards of care they can't really require it but their recommendation was a certain mm. it went down to three months and it was made almost I, I think it was basically optional three months of therapy so, so the standards of care did make a pivot mm. from this quote gatekeeping 
And I, I get it. I get why people call it that because you had to go, you had to jump through a bunch of hoops. Yeah. And people don't want to ever have to, people don't want to do that generally. When I went through my transition in the early days, I did it through the Department of Veterans Affairs and through mm -hmm. Kaiser Permanente. Mm -hmm. And so I got my hormones through the VA, but I got surgeries through Kaiser Permanente. Mm -hmm. And with Kaiser Permanente, I was routed into see a therapist before yeah. I got my bottom surgery. I got right. top surgery with, I just went to Dr. Michael Brownstein in San Francisco and he yeah. asked me if I had a letter and I said, no, why do I need one? And he asked me how old I was. And at the time I was like 40 years old and he's like, oh no, right? So there, there's a difference, yeah. right? I was older, yeah. you were That's older. Right. So I, I get how the people who went through the older version of the standards of care yeah. process it was cumbersome. It took a lot of time. Yeah, that's right. And in the process, people were maybe experiencing bodily distress. They're experiencing yeah. distress in their personal lives because mm -hmm. they were struggling with, with work and their families. So yeah. I get that it was probably difficult for people. I, they... I, I literally had to go through that. So I actually had to have the letter. I really don't like the word gatekeeping. I actually use it as safekeeping. I, I, I really feel on some level, gatekeeping sounds so negative. Where safekeeping sounds like I care about you as a medical space. We just want to make sure that this is the place that you're going to not make a U-turn and, you know, that if there are irreversible things to this and not making it so easily accessible and then going, whoops, because now that's why I believe we're seeing so many. De Did you do you remember detransitioners when you were transitioning? Well, like, neither do I. I, I don't definitely not. I don't um, remember one. I, I did run into a couple of people and that was a, that was probably 10 years into my transition, but yeah. that's when I started noticing that the, the informed consent clinics were popping up yeah. and that's where people were sort of starting on hormones and then stopping. You know, it's interesting, you know, remember just a few minutes ago, I said that you can have 10 patients go to the same clinic, but they're having 10 different experiences. Yeah. I think this thing around gatekeeping is similar. Yeah. I think that there were providers back in the day. Mm -hmm who had our best interest at heart That's right. and they wanted to make sure that we were solid, that That's we right. knew exactly what we were going to do. Because let's, yeah. let's be honest. It's not easy to go from being a woman to a man in society or vice versa. That's right. This is not an easy thing to do. That's right. right. Socially, economically, right. all the different ways, right. but it's probably also true that there were providers who were of the ilk where they required people to, quote, prove that they were really trans. That's right. And so I think yeah. what happened is you had people who had good experiences through the old safekeeping model, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. quote, gatekeeping. And mm -hmm. you had people who had bad experiences who were maybe fetishized or exploited mm -hmm. or denied for every little thing. Sure. And so those two, those two parallel experiences, at some point in time, it's as if only the negative ones that's were the right. ones that were visible, that were being, that people were talking about. Because if you had a good experience with transition, you weren't really talking about it. You were just That's living right. your life. And so, yeah. the, so we started to hear all these negative stories about people who were, you know, going through the yeah. ringer. And so the idea was, okay, let's get rid of all of this gatekeeping or I like mm -hmm. safekeeping. Let's get rid of all of it because mm -hmm. it's paternalistic. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't have to prove ourselves, right? I, right? I understand the argument. And on and I interviewed Dr. Erica Anderson recently here on the Excellent. Umbrella Hour. And she talked about a, a psychology, like a, a client of hers, right? She's a psychologist, a client of hers who thought that cross-sex hormones or gender affirming hormones should be available over the counter. <laughs> That's how far... <laughs> That's how far it, it's it's come that people, wow. and I I don't think that that person is alone in thinking. Oh that no, way. a lot of people think that a lot of people because because they uh, no I get both sides, but if you're gonna look at it, let's look at it like this. What I said earlier, how many people were detransitioning back then, and how many are now? There are. Th hundreds if not thousands i'm not kidding of kids making the wrong turns because we don't have some kind of situation now maybe what we can do is find nuance in that and we can not have it so hardcore over here we can't have it so loose over here but we have some system i'm looking for a system i believe in systems especially when it comes to medical care but it's there's a there's a it's called a cushion it's called a bumper it's so that you know i know i had to do that live as a man for a year before i could get hormones i had to do that whole thing but i was sort of already doing that as a book dyke right so so it was real simple and didn't make but i i'm concerned with kids who are not showing any sign of any 
dysphoria, any sign of anything that, ha- and then one day just saying I'm trans. Those are the kids I'm concerned about. And are they latching on to something? And then they have access to it all in two minutes without any kind of safekeeping. And that that's sort of where I'm standing in it. It's not that I want to make it difficult for anybody. That's not at all. I want everyone to transition who needs to. That is 100% my mission. But at the same time, I want to make sure that you aren't making the wrong, you know, and I'm older. So I'm coming with things in a more lived experience way. And I'm coming to things, I think, in a more reserved way where, you know, I remember when I was 20, dude, I want it all. <laughs> right? Give it to me. <laughs> you know, of course I get it. And now we have social media, dude. We can't deny the social media impact on the trans community. We just can't, especially when it's so easily accessible and you can self ID without anything like Anyone knows themselves, but that's not necessarily true. We're going to take a short commercial break. We'll return shortly. UK Health Radio, the station that makes you feel good. UK Health Radio, the station that makes you feel good. We're back from our break. Let's pick up where we left off. I don't identify, like I said, as a trans person. It's an identity choice these days, which is different than I think you and I, where we really did need to sort of identify as men and be men in this world. Well, I, I was on a panel earlier today, actually, speaking with some clinicians, psychologists and mental health counselors and social workers and some physicians as well. Mm-hmm. And somebody asked a question of us on the panel about our uh, how our identity. I don't identify as trans, right? I don't, it's, I don't, just like I don't identify as Hispanic or Latino. I I am, I (laughs) am a first generation American (laughs) with a family from Mexico, but I don't, I, 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 I'm, I'm similar in the way that I think it's, it might be our generation. Yeah. You know, you're like, you're a, you're at the bottom of the boomers and I'm at the top of the Gen X. That's right. You know, we're about, I think I'm almost 57, you're 60, right? So we're yeah. pretty close. Yeah. Um, so you're just right over the hump as one of those Pepsi generation boomers. <laughs> totally. I'm the uh, breakfast club Gen X <laughs> store. And we're close in the type of world that we grew up in because I'm also from Los Angeles, mm-hmm. right? And That's so right. We, we grew up in a time when it was pretty much okay to be a tomboy. Totally. And even within my Mexican family, it was okay. And being gender non-conforming, as you would call it now. Yep. But it, it's you're right. It is very different now. I, th- I think yep. you're right about social media. I'm not yep. on social media, so I don't Good see for you. it. But I do hear it. <laughs> um so, I see it. I see it all the time. And, you know, I, like I said, I do a lot of interviews with young kids and even ones who have transitioned and are perfectly okay with it. But I'm getting a lot of nuanced conversation here. And I just interviewed this one kid who said they were literally sucked into it by TikTok. They detransitioned back to a woman. But, you know, they were like 500,000 TikTok followers and her partner was a trans man. He had 7 million followers. They were so influential on there that people would just listen to everything they said and were like, I trans or asking them, do you think I'm trans? And this is a powerful influence they have over these young people. And then how they all just wanted to identify as trans. None of them have a diagnosis. And that when she decided she wanted to detransition and go back to living as a woman because she just didn't feel like she was being honest about it, they all turned on her. They all actually turned on her. She said it was the most insane thing I've ever dealt. The hate was absurd. So we need to look at these things. These these are detrimental, not only to the trans community, but to the mental health of these young people that are being put into a space that night not, and in fact, I don't think is for them. I, I can't even comprehend how a young person can have 7 million people that are hanging on their every word. It's um, crazy. I it's don't. Crazy. I I mean, I remember being a teenager. It's a very bumpy ride being That's a teenager. Right. Right? There's, <laughs> there's so much, there's so much inconsistency, and there's yep. so much going on. Identity formation and troubles with friends, and trying to figure out 
who am I? What am I going to be in the world? And that's right. being treated like a pseudo young adult, but still feeling like that's a kid. right. Like oh it's, my it's God. These are 16. Time. These are 16 year old kids. Some of them are 22. Still 22 is young to me. I don't care. And they're being influenced by somebody who just, tra- how is that? In- how are these people having so much power to, you know, they're literally pushing top surgery. They're pushing be trans. It'll change your life. And it does not change your life unless you're actually prepared for all the things that come with that. I fight back against that hashtag trans is beautiful. I hate it because it just feels like they're giving this false idea of what it means to be trans and that your whole life will be amazing afterward. And, you know, they're not talking about the lifelong stuff we have to do here. It's not you just become trans and if there's so many things you have to deal with as a trans person that I don't think is being addressed. It's all pretty, pretty, pretty. And all the other things are being put over here. You mentioned earlier something about the community being hijacked. Yeah. What What do you mean? Is is this part of it? Is that what you mean? Yeah, sure. I, I, I what I mean is, so as you know, I, I, I think you, you said you do too. I identify as a transsexual, and I do that because I don't want to be part of this transgender narrative, which I find is more ideological on some level. And so, so for myself, it's a medical condition. I want to be binary. That's da, 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 whatever. I'm not judging how anybody else wants to do it, but I don't relate to this new trans a space where basically that umbrella of a min, every kind of pronoun, every kind of identity, every kind of anything that has to do with gender, you know, people are calling themselves it, they, clown, po- clown, ner- I mean, just insane neo pronoun. It's like, what is happening here? That that just has nothing to do with me. I'm just real basic. I'm real binary. <laughs> I did this. I live like this. So I feel like it has been hijacked on some level for, by a younger generation and with, an, with, a, with this idea that anyone can be trans. And that's just not true. And so, yeah, I feel like it's been hijacked and the message has been hijacked. And there's an, um, there's a different way of being over there that, that I don't, I don't in any way, shape or form feel connected to. And so why I want, there's people out there that are like me and like you who just have this situation. They want to be men and move forward. And I think if that's lost within that whole trans narrative, then these people don't have people like us to see who, you know, did it so long ago and are willing to, sort of show ourselves to them. And I think if they don't have a representation under that umbrella, that's just not representing the whole trend. And we don't, we don't get represented under that umbrella on some level. We're considered old and antiquated and (laughs) derogatory and all kinds of weird things. So that's why I separate myself from that. And that's why I look at it as a, as a more of an ideological space. It sounds like what you're wanting is coexistence. Total. I've all, that's like literally my middle name. <laughs> so I believe in co, I coexist with the world. I have since my transition. I've never pushed on anybody. I never expected people to just take, of course, people are not going to be okay with me. And that's perfectly okay. But this new narrative says if you don't accept me, you're a transphobe or you're a turf or you're a bigot or you're a Nazi. And that's not, that has nothing to do with that. And I find that to be on some level detrimental to the future of the trans space. You know, I, We'll tell you this, Sander. I have never felt as a transsexual or trans person more disliked in the world than the last five or so years. I, people, I get along with the world, dude. You know, I travel the world. I have friends from every walk of life. I get asked to sit at every table, even hardcore conservative Christian right, who's not my space, but they invite me to the table. So. I can show you that that's not true what they're saying, that everyone hates us. The pe- the reason why people don't particularly like what's going on now because of this way of being that they have, that if you don't accept us, you are X, Y, and Z, or trans women are women. Trans women are not women. I know that's a very, very difficult thing for a lot of people to understand. And all of a sudden, I'd be called transphobic because it's not true. They're trans women. They are biological males who are transitioning to live their life as women. Who cares? It's awesome and it's amazing. It's the opposite of me. But this idea that trans women are women and we all have to get on this narrative and it's a lie. It's a blatant actual lie. And that's hurtful. It's not only hurtful to me as a biological female who lived a lot of my life as a woman, and I understand the fight as a woman. It's also hurtful to us as trans people. I feel like we're lying. We're lying to the world. I like that you talked about that you are invited into a lot of different spaces. I'm also invited into a lot of different spaces. <laughs> and I, I find myself having conversations with people who would be labeled hateful, they would be designated as people who want to, quote, erase someone like me. 
And what I find is that they 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 really do recognize that there is a there is a diversity within the trans community. Yeah. Right. That they recognize that we're all we're all very different. We've come from different mm-hmm. backgrounds. We have different ideas about things. We have different political affiliations and we come from different socioeconomic groups and yeah. different kinds of families and faith systems. And yeah. it's like they do recognize that. I recognize that we're not a monolith. You already said that you recognize we're not a monolith. Yeah. And so this idea of coexistence also makes sense to me because I want to be able to travel the world, right? I want to be able to travel through my lifetime yeah. in coexistence with my siblings who are other gendered. That's right. Because they can do whatever they want to do, but I want them to have the same, the same respect, the same point of view yeah. that says That's Xander right. and people like Xander and Buck, they can do yep. them how they want to do them. And what I find is that I still meet pretty regularly. I still meet 20 something year olds, 30 something year olds, 40 something year olds who are very binary in Mm -hmm. how they see themselves present to the world, how they make sense of everything. Uh, so they're able to, I guess, sift through, they're able to sift through all of this noise that's coming through on social media. There's a big difference between people are driven either by external Mm -hmm. or internal things. Yeah. Right. And so if you have a, an internal sense of self, Mm-hmm. Then, then like I have that. It sounds like you have that. Yep, I, yep. I'm not very easily persuaded out of my sense of equilibrium, my own That's homeostasis, right. Yep. right? In my yep. body, in my mind, in my heart. But for people who are very externally oriented, mm-hmm. they can more easily be dissuaded, persuaded, knocked off, pushed around, convinced of things that might not be true for them. That's but right. it's because they're seeking a sense of validation externally that's versus right. uh, validating themselves internally. And that's, I think, coexistence allows for that. What you're talking about sounds more like there's an overshadowing, mm-hmm. an attempt well, to put sort of a, a dark cloud over certain members of the trans community. That's right. So that we're not visible to others, that's which right. I don't really understand what the end game is for that. Well, control. That's how I look at it. There's some control mechanism there. And there's this idea that what we're saying doesn't sort of correspond with what they're trying to make the world look at as trans, right? So, so I think that's the reason why we have this dark cloud put over. We're old or we don't know it was different back then. Or, you know, there's just so many tropes that they love to shove down my throat when I'm like, but I can prove you wrong. That's not true. There are young people just like me out there and they want to be just like me. I have tons of young people who come to me saying, thank you so much, Buck, for speaking up. You know, they say it all the time to me, but I can't because X, Y, and Z, because they're shut down or they'll be ostracized. They need that community. These young people need community. It's important for them. I get it. I remember when I was young, that community was important to me, right? I don't necessarily need that community so much today. I have a different type of community, but that that's the problem. These kids are needing this community and this community is lying to them because what you just said, they're so easily influenced that they can just be told that, and like I said, I'm going to go back to this detransitioner kid that I just did. He said that peer pressure is insane. If you're a little bit butch, because she just is a butch dyke. She's like, I'm a butch dyke. And then everyone's telling me I'm trans and I'm not, I'm just a butch dyke. And then she said that the, the pressure to transition is so insane. And I'm like, wow. I mean, thank you for saying that because this is what people need to see. These kids are so, they're looking, they're seeking. A lot of them have some stuff going on at home or whatever's happening to them and they just need this validation and if they don't go along with the narrative, they're not going to be validated. Even though she told me, they many of these people don't believe the narrative. They're just scared not to say it because they don't want to lose their friendships or their, their friend space. You know, this thing about the difference between being a butch woman and a trans man. When I first came into the community in 2000 is when Mm -hmm. I started hearing all the stories about how there Mm -hmm. was this tension between the lesbian community and the FTM community. Uh, For those of you who are unfamiliar, FTM stands for female to male. It was a category (laughs) that was created by Lou Sullivan, a gay trans man, because before that they used to call us female transsexuals. That's right. I and tell you, remember that. Said we're female to male. So FTM is sort of a shorthand. <laughs> awesome. That's, that's old school. And I remember I would even go to public events where people would be debating and arguing about how all the butches were transitioning. 
I um, remember and, that. And now it's like, of course, it's not true, but there probably no. was a surge yeah. at a particular <laughs> time. In your introduction, you, you mentioned women's rights and children's rights. Yeah. And this gets us into the issue around children, because... If you're talking about teenagers on TikTok and that kind of pressure, and you're talking about this young, butch, lesbian, young person who mm -hmm. had that kind of peer pressure is just part of adolescence. I had peer pressure. You had totally. peer pressure. There That's were bullies. Right. I didn't succumb to bullies because I was a big enough kid that I used to beat up bullies. Me um, too. So <laughs> right on. The kids that got picked on would come and tell me that so-and-so's picking on me. <laughs> and so I would go pick on the bullies. But I know, I know it's real. And I know that not everybody has the ability to withstand Stand it. I have that. I'm so yeah. grateful. I don't know where it came from. It might just be my default temperament setting. I do not suffer fools. And <laughs> so, but for these kids that are more persuadable, they are more externally driven, seeking that validation. And now we have the issues of lots of states are proposing laws that will restrict access right. to medications, whether mm -hmm. it's puberty suppressing medications or, right. or transitioning, you know, the cross sex yep. hormones or gender affirming yep. hormones, people refer to them also. So I would imagine when you say children's rights, it's mm -hmm. in this, it's in yeah. this area. That's Talk right. a little bit about that. Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on that. And so as an actual transsexual person, and actually I was a kid, and I, I was a kid who was very masculine, and on some level I might have had dysphoria, who knows. But I was a tomboy, and I had a great childhood. I don't want anybody to – I did not have a bad childhood. I had an awesome childhood. My parents were super cool and awesome, and I was just that little dude, right? But that being said, I think today kids aren't being able to sort of just be in that space of tomboyishness or gender nonconforming, and they're immediately put in – you know, we worked hard. You and I and all of us, we worked hard to get rid of gender stereotypes. We really did. We we really celebrated kids with girls with short hair and boys with long hair or whatever that meant, a feminine boy or a very masculine girl. And we were all just like, who cares? I feel like this new trans sort of trans kids movement is very anti that and anti just letting kids be non-conforming. And they really are pushing kids back into these sort of stereotypes by saying, oh, well, gosh, little what's-her-name doesn't want to wear a barrette in her hair. She must be trans. I mean, I actually see stuff like this. I'm like, what? Or, or you know, oh, well, he, he has a, a more of an attraction towards female toys. What are you talking about? Like, they've always been like that. So immediately they're labeled as trans kids. And it's why I don't even use that term trans kids, because I don't want to put these kids in that space. I think that these kids are kids who are dealing with with either just normal childhood gender non-conforming or maybe they have some stuff going on and they might be trans but to just label a child out the gate at 10 or i mean they're doing it all the way down to eight years old i've seen giving them suppressants like puberty blockers which i'm not sure if people understand those things are insane and i've done a, my own research on them and i've talked to people on them and i've done a lot of research on the specific drug called lupron and it is horrifying what happens to the long-term use of these it can sterilization can happen growth of certain physical attributes that could be detrimental to the growth of an adult i mean it's just crazy i'm thinking what why would we do this to a child? And I really fight against this idea that there are trans kids. And I say, well, they might be trans, but they're more kids that are just sort of dealing with life and finding their space. And puberty to me is extremely important. I don't care what gender or sex you are. Puberty is part of life. That is a fact. And there are many things that happen to this child and this human going through puberty that, I mean, I, I went through female puberty. You went through female puberty. We look like dudes. <laughs> it did not hinder us in any way, shape or form. So I don't understand if how you think a child could ever even consent to understanding what it means to have top surgery at 13. And that is happening. I, I will push back on people who tell me that's not happening. It is actually happening. I've seen it with my own eyes. And my understanding about the blockers is that mm -hmm. when it was in, in, you know, the Dutch protocol, when it was that's first right. developed, this idea was that if we put these children on these puberty blockers, then they won't go through the secondary characteristic development. So for wow. example, there won't be Adam's apples developing. Wow. There won't be breast budding going on. There won't be the shoulder yeah. white. There won't be the squaring yeah. of the jaw. And because of that, it would save people all of the, the money and all of the time. They wouldn't wow. have to get facial feminization surgeries. They wouldn't have to get top surgeries. They wouldn't have to get, yeah. you know, the, the tracheal yep. shaves. Like yep. I understand, like, it's very aesthetics driven. It and is. It, yeah. what's what was interesting to me is that I've, there's been so much going on about this topic in the last couple yeah. of years. I wasn't really weighing in on one side or the other. 
because I was I was listening to the quote experts and I wanted to hear what all the experts had yeah. to say. And because I come from working in the systems of hospitals and medical yep. centers and and then all of a sudden within the last year, what starts happening? Well, the country of Sweden, their their top medical right review board or yeah. whatever the name is there, they've yeah. decided now there's it's not really worth it to give these children these blocking medications. And then Finland did the same. And there's other things going on right now in the UK. I've heard yeah. France has been do- doing some stuff. Even I think the Netherlands is is rethinking. Yeah. New Zealand and Australia are kind of reworking some stuff right now. So it's like, yeah. well... Now the problem is the experts are in just, there's no consensus among the experts. That's right. And when there's no consensus among That's the right. experts, yep. how are we, how are we as lay people, how are we supposed to know where to fall? We're going to take a short commercial break. We'll return shortly. UK Health Radio. The station that makes you feel good. The station that makes you feel good. We're back from our break. Let's pick up where we left off. It does make sense to me that individual medical personnel in the United States and Canada have Mm -hmm. their own expertise, but Mm -hmm. it sure, it does sound quite, there's some weight, right? There's some weight to the fact that, that the country of Sweden, the country of Finland, their medical That's review right. division or office, they ca- it wasn't just individuals. It was a, a government entity. And these yes. are places that have been doing these this kind of care for much longer than we've been doing. Yes. It. And so I'm like, well, how do we reconcile that? And I think that's where we're at in this country and in Canada, probably, is mm-hmm. that how do we reconcile what these other countries used to do and now what they're starting to do now? And then, well, we we got the protocol on how to deal with blockers from the Dutch. That's right. And so, if That's the Dutch right. are going to stop doing it largely, I don't know if they're uh-huh. completely cutting it off. But if they're if it's not going to be just part of their regular treatment model, how are we going to respond to that? And it sounds like it seems to me that we're responding in the United States in a way that's very oppositional. Like you're not the boss of me. You can't tell that's me right. what to do. It <laughs> feels like that's kind of how we're we're coming at it. Um because it's because, true. Because it will be a loss. We can't be we can't be ignorant of the fact that this will be a loss. I know I live in Florida and here in Florida, they definitely have, have put some things into place. They don't yeah. want children to have access. But m- what I've read, I've read I go and read the laws because I want to mm-hmm. be I don't want to just read what what yeah. the Huffington Post has to say about the That's law. Right. Like I want to read my own. I'm not sure if Huffington Post even exists anymore, but um, <laughs> But it's, I haven't seen it actually, but so when I go and read it, it says that if you're already under treatment, you get to continue your treatment. Yeah, that's right. So my hope is that that's, if these other states go the way of Florida, that they'll mm-hmm. do something similar. If you're already under care and treatment yes. of a physician, a nurse practitioner, physician assistant, whomever yes. in your state is licensed to be able to provide that level of care, then you right. get to continue on. That's same right. With, same with Medicaid patients in Florida. If yeah. you're if you're on Medicaid, you've been receiving treatment, you'll continue to receive treatment. That's I think right. that's that's the kind, right? That's the do no yeah. harm way to do things. Now right. who it's gonna upset are people who are just coming through. And my experience with that is similar to with the military. Yeah. You know, a lot of people don't know that I worked for the uh, military during the Trump administration on a transgender care team for the US Navy. And so I was Working with this team for three and a half years, I worked with upwards of about 300 active duty service wow. members that were in the Navy, the Marine Corps, the U.S. Coast Guard, who wow. had command approval to go through a gender transition. And we had a whole system in place, right? As the clinical case manager, I developed the intake process, the orientation process. We had a case consultation process where I presented slides and we had wow. team members, multidisciplinary team members from psychology and psychiatry and primary health and endocrinology and urology and gynecology. We had all these people on our team and most of them were uniformed officers, by mm-hmm. the way. So it was a civilian wow. military thing. And so I did that for three and a half years. So I know that a system mm-hmm. works. Most of the people who got referred to our program 
most of them went through the whole treatment process. That's right. Because That's right. because the people who were referring them do, did their due diligence. That's right. Um, in referring them, they had to have a gender dysphoria diagnosis. <laughs> That's all I'm saying here. And I'm also saying that if every other country is shutting down something so drastic, and also this is only what you just said for physical attributes. What about the stuff you're not seeing that's inside, right? That this affects bone growth, brain growth, eye, what, all, everything that puberty does. There's detrimental health, long-term life health problems that can come from this. So, so now we're overriding those because we're worried about someone having an Adam's apple. Well, what if this kid changed their mind at 18, which is pretty much could actually happen. But we as adults are saying, oh, no, we're going to put this kid here so he doesn't grow big shoulders or we that seems putting the cart before the horse. Why aren't we sending this kid to some serious mental health situation or kind of maybe just letting him dress up or instead we're going straight to these blockers because we're worried they're going to have big shoulders or big hands. That just seems so insane to me and not worried about the inside. We're only more worried about the outside of this patient. That that scares me and I don't I don't want to be a part of that. But until we have it solid and we understand really what's going on here, and America's ramping it up. Well, every other country's ramping it down. What you said, it's, Amer- it's so American. It's just so American to say, well, you're not telling us what to do. <laughs> I'm like, no one's telling you what to do. We're telling you it's not working right now. So let's just yeah. back off of the kids for a minute here. <laughs> well, you know, those physical attributes, like I, I have I have absolute empathy for the trans women who of course. are built like a lumberjack. That's I, right. I, mean, I, I really, I really do have have empathy, a lot of, of compassion for that. And even, you know, trans guys who develop very, very large, large breasts. breasts that are physically uncomfortable. I get the reason behind it. Yes. But now we know, right, even the even the FDA here in the United that's States right. has put a warning label on Lupron. And I know oh, Lupron shit. isn't the only one that's being used, no, it's but I not. think it's a primary one. Yes. And we just need to know more about these things. And so instead of, so to take it out of the political realm, that's take right. It out, right. Take it out of that. That's let's right. put it back into the medical. It's become a political hot topic. And also, yes. you know, and also I want to say that the majority of young people that are transitioning are young girls. It's not young boys. So that's the other issue I have with it. It just seems like it's more young girls that are going through this. And, you know, young girls don't necessarily get the same physical attributes that young boys become men and do that. I feel I have the same compassion and empathy that you do for this. But trans is a very small majority of the wor- minority of the world. It's small. It's not so big. And I feel like this is experimental. And I also know what they tell parents to sort of get them into this space. We're not being honest with parents. And, you know, it's hard. I'm a parent. It's, it's, it's a very hard space to be in when you're telling, you know, them that they have to do this. The kid isn't going to be happy. All of these. Of course, a parent is going to do it because they want to, they want to save their kid. They, they want to be a, a great parent and do the right thing for their kid. But I don't think parents are being really told the actual real truth of what's happening here. Let me throw a devil's advocate kind of wrench into sure. this. So. Okay, so we're trans men, we're transsexuals. Yep. We were gender non-conforming little girls. We were part of lesbian community. Mm-hmm. Uh, we became, when we became adults, we transitioned. And people would mm-hmm. say, well, you had the opportunity to become who you are without as many obstacles. Don't you wish you would have had the ability to transition when you were younger? I say no to that. So you're, do I. You're saying no as well. I saw yep. you nodding your head. The audience nope. can't. I would not have because I think I would have been a big a-hole if I had dressed it. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I asked my parents. I'm really got a great parents. And I asked them, I said, would you, because they're like freaked out when they see this. <laughs> they're like, I'm like, would you give me puberty blockers? They're like, no. We thought first off you would grow out of it. And secondly, no, that's just weird. And so, uh, yeah, I, you know, of course we struggled. Of course struggle is part of life. Not trans people aren't the only ones who struggle. That's ridiculous. And so, you know, kids struggle with all kinds. It's hard to be a kid. But I'm telling you now, I'm looking back, I am really grateful that I got to live. I lived two lives. You know, I lived a whole life as a gay woman and a sports and, you know, all kinds of cool stuff as a, as a, as a female. And, you know, I was around a during model. the AIDS. Oh my God, I was totally a model, dude. That's so insane. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I was around during the AIDS epidemic and, you know, lost all my friends. But I was a hardcore dykey les and we were there for the gay, gay men. And I have so many experiences that I cherish not losing my friends, but, you know, being in this space. And I know it's hard to see that when you're in it. But when you actually get out of it and you can look back, those experiences are I cherish them beyond belief. Yeah, I don't you know, I don't think 
people can really understand when we talk about how going through difficult experiences when we were younger, how yeah. really significant and impactful they are for us now. That's it's right. like, because yeah. you mean, you know, I mentioned that at the top of the hour, like I was institutionalized. Yeah. I spent three months in a psychiatric hospital. Then I spent yeah. a little over a year and a half in a group home for delinquent girls. And then I spent another year in another psychiatric hospital. And in that last institutionalization, I went through what they called fashion therapy, which is basically conversion therapy. And it's like, was it difficult? Yeah. But here again is where personality and temperament comes into play right. because I treated it like a big game. Mm hmm. So because I'm internally solid enough, even as a young person, I was internally right. solid yep. that when they were making me, this is what the fashion therapist did. They took mm. me into a private room, showed me how to shave my legs, how to put on <laughs> pantyhose, how to <laughs> dress like a dress like a proper feminine oh. girl, do my hair, right? Curling iron, the whole wow. thing, put on makeup. And then they would have me basically catwalk around the psych unit and have the male patients and male staff members whistle and catcall at me to reinforce reinforce my, my femininity. God. And and I knew the whole time I was doing it, I wasn't angry. I wasn't humiliated. I wasn't embarrassed. I, none of those things occurred to me. In my mind, what I was thinking was, yeah, just walk around this thing a couple of times and then you'll be able to watch Dallas on TV tonight. <laughs> like, that's, that was my reward. My reward is I got to watch Dallas. Wow. It was very behaviorally oriented for me. It was a reward system. And wow. I was all about collecting rewards. Give me the tokens, wow. give me the points, give me the action access to liberties. I never internalized any of that. I never took on the identity or the feelings of I'm wrong, I'm bad. But you That's know, right. we both know there are people who have gone through experiences like mine That's or right. less severe or even more mm -hmm. severe, and they are, they're just damaged. Yeah. Their psyche That's right. is damaged. That's Their right. mental health is just, it's been through the meat grinder. But I think it's important for us to know that not only are we not a monolith, we all have very different That's temperaments right. and personalities. And, That's right. and we have, some of us are internally directed, some of us are externally directed, mm -hmm. and we need to be able to differentiate. And I really wish there was a way, I wish there was a particular test that you could give mm -hmm. and say, yeah, no, you're just going to be gender non-conforming your adulthood. Go yeah. on. No, you're definitely trans. And put you yep. through and nope, you're not trans. You're not, trans, <laughs> you're trans. But there is no way to be able to do that because nope. just because we were gender non-conforming, that in and of itself doesn't mean we would have transitioned. There are lots of gender non-conforming. Oh my God. Gay That's people, my friends. lesbian people, straight people. Dude, all the chicks I was on the track team with were total True. dykes. Yeah, they didn't ponies. transition. No. And some of them became straight women with That's babies. Right. I say That's it all right. the time. I'm like, That's just a nonsense that yeah. you think that. I can show you that those girls yeah. didn't transition. I did. Did. So, so you're right. I mean, I mean, wow, dude, you have such an amazing story. I'm going to keep bugging it about to make a book because this is such a great, incredible story of, of, of perseverance. And I think that that's what we're not teaching a younger generation today. We're teaching a very victimy. Wow, well, I'm trans. No one likes me. That's not true. <laughs> that is just not true. <laughs> I agree that we need to be, you know, that's what I do in my day job, so to speak, is I teach people how to regulate emotions, tolerate yeah. distress, right. navigate through uncertainty. Right. effectively communicate, mitigate conflict, manage yep. their stress. This is what I teach adults. That's what I do for a living. And I tell people all the time, it's like, if you have a kid and they're living in a state where they're no longer going to have access to certain medications, then, well, you can move if you can afford it. If you can't afford that, then teach your kids resiliency skills, give them coping skills, and then support them in all the ways you can. Let them mm -hmm. wear their hair how they want to wear it. Let them dress how they want to dress. Right. Give them them a nickname until right. they're until it gets changed yep. legally and yep. then when they turn age of adulthood wherever mm -hmm. country they're in if they want to then pursue the medical process that's on yeah, them yeah. that's but right i say that all them, the time give them yeah. those skills to strengthen their inner fortitude well so we're not giving them skills we're giving them whatever they need whatever they want not necessarily what they need this yeah. is the new generation i'll just give the kid what they want like what no that's not parenting you're supposed to be there to push back you're supposed to be there to be sort of like the leader it's like they've flipped it the kids are the leader now if you don't do this for me i'm gonna kill myself they're giving them this these ideas to say or or i'm i'm you, go ahead run right away from home dude if my kid said i'm gonna you can't go run here i'll pack your bag for you see you later dude 
it. <laughs> You'll be back I, in two minutes. <laughs> I, I I remember a time when I was when I was challenged to fine, go ahead. Yeah, that's right. Me too. Me yeah. too. Go I, ahead. And I and I did. I went. Yeah. So <laughs> I hopped I. on my Schwinn cruiser. And I went. <laughs> well, Buck. It's been really wonderful having you on the oh, show. We're sweet. about to wrap up. Is there is there any closing message that you'd like to leave our listeners with? Well, really, first off, I just really, really appreciate the work you're doing, Xander. It means a lot to me. And I think the young people really will, will benefit from you as an elder in this community. And so really just making this program has been so beautiful and awesome. And I appreciate you giving me the space to speak when I think a lot of times I'm not invited uh, to the trans table anymore. It feels like great and you know, brotherly. And also the fact that I get to tell people a different side of, of what's going on out there. And I feel, feel like it's become a sort of monolithic way of being trans. And I think this show is so important. We need it so bad right now. So thanks to everybody listening. And I appreciate you having me on the show today. And I, I really look forward to more, more conversations that you're going to have with all people. And I, I wish you lots of luck and success with this, with this podcast. Thank you so much, Buck. Um, hopefully, maybe we will be able to have you back on again. Talk cool. About some other stuff. Let's all do right. it. Thanks, buddy. Bye-bye.